Hello and welcome to Tank Week. I've been quite excited about this. I mean, I mean, I, I'm excited about all my weeks, but Tank Week is pretty cool. And you'll have just noticed if you follow me on Twitter, I've just scheduled a show for tomorrow night as well now. So Richard Fisher is coming on to talk about machine guns in tanks. We'll probably also talk about smoke generators and other things as well. But that'll be exciting. Then we've got Niels and Pritt and uh, Philip coming up. So five shows, five cool subjects um, looking at tanks and armored warfare. But tonight we're talking, we're setting off with the <coughs> 1920s, 30s. How did it all begin in terms of how the British went from the end of the Great War <coughs> to the Second World War? And joining me, Gareth Davies. You've seen him on World War II TV. You've seen him on all sorts of things. Burmese Core on Twitter talking about um, armored stuff. Royal Tank Regiment, veteran of 25 years, Minister of Defense, war analyst, war friend. You've done it all, haven't you, Gareth? So I've done a bit of it, Woody. Well, welcome to the show. So um, thank you. Just to begin us off. So the Great War, probably the biggest single technological new thing that came out was tank warfare. Um, Certainly that people remember, yeah. Yeah, and and then we so we now have this thing. We now the, every army now by the end of the war has seen what tanks can do. The Great War ends, and then there's all well. We're not going to go for the politics as such, but then you know the Great War, assuming that's going to be the war to end all wars. But we've now got this technology. What we're going to do with it? So, um, run us. We're going to run through over the next hour or so what happened over those next twenty years, really, and ask the question. Was the British Army in 1939, when war um, started, in a fit position with its armour to fight that war, I suppose, is the question we will be posing, without necessarily answering it in full, but certainly posing it. And, 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 and without, spoiler alert, saying that it was a bit rubbish, um, we might look at one or two people to blame for that. But I've got my pet um, man I blame for, for, for a lot of things, who's everybody else's hero, but we'll, we'll come to Percy Hobart later. Yeah, um, which I think is when you said that in our prep for that, that was really interesting because, you know, he is so, so well regarded. But I'm talking about Percy Hobart very much from a Normandy point of view, from a 1944 era. And of course, like a lot of people around by the, that <laughs> point, he had a 20 plus year career before then, 20, 30 year. And um, that's the part we're going to talk about. So at the end of the First World War, just to remind our viewers, what had the British Army been using tanks for? Well, it was interesting. I mean, in your intro, you mentioned that they had these things. Um, they actually had a lot of things. They had, um, by that stage, some Mark IV, some Mark V tanks, which is probably really the, the product. That's that classic First World War tank, the, 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 the rhomboid shape. Um, Mark I, Mark II, Mark IVs are prototypes, pre-production models. Mark Vs are the sort of probably the, the production model. They get developed, slightly bigger ones around. But we've also got medium A's, the Whippet, which is either a light tank or a medium tank. And I'll, I'll come to that in a, in a bit, I think. So we've got some things, but we've still got um, horse drawn artillery, horse artillery, field artillery. We've still got the cavalry who yeah. haven't done a huge amount. Not their fault. They do some cracking stuff in 1914. I mean, look at the Ninth Lancers, look at the Twelfth Lancers. Um, some, some fantastic actions, especially around. Um, First Eep in, 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 in later 1914, sort of October, November. Uh, and Haig, actually, as a core commander, throws the cavalry around with, with, with tactical aplomb. Um, so we've got all of this. Cavalry haven't done much on the Western Front, but they have done quite a bit in other places like Palestine. Um, most of those are mounted, mounted, um, mounted rifles, Australian light horse, but let's not worry about the distinction at this stage. So we've, we've got this stuff, and we don't really know what to do with it. We knew what we were trying to do with it in the first of all, and the role of armor back then was um, the object. 1916, I think you said, was to um, to help the infantry forward, and especially deal with machine guns. So from from the word go, it's absolutely supporting the infantry. And there's that great line: infantry was it um, artillery dominates infantry. God, I can't remember. Artillery conquers infantry. Occupy. That's the one. Um, it's actually those three arms working together. So stonk it with artillery. Um, tanks then support the infantry onto the position. Sometimes the infantry is supporting the tanks onto the position, but it's those two arms working together. And, and in 1916, 1970, it's all about breakthrough. We don't really succeed in, in, in those battles in 1917. Yeah, Cornbury, we break through, but then other stuff goes wrong. The cavalry don't exploit. So tanks on the up, cavalry arguably don't do so well. But, but actually, it's not because the cavalry are that much at fault. It's more of a command and control issue. If the cavalry got the order to to push 
um, north across the canal earlier, actually Cornbury could have been quite different, but I'm not into to, to counterfactuals or what ifs. So 1917 breakthrough, 1918 it's breakthrough at, at Hamel is a starter for Tim, and then at Amiens in, in August. But then it's pursuit. And you get this mixture, you get some of the Mark Fives and some Mark Fours trying to support the infantry who are pushing forward. But we've got at the same time, we've got exploitation going on. We've got three exploitation weapons, I reckon. We've got the Whippet tank, which is a medium, which is, what do we say, it goes at twice as fast as a, as, as a Mark V. So it's, what, eight miles an hour. Um, a slightly fast walking man. We've got mounted cavalry, and the Whippets and cavalry try to work together, not massively successfully. And we've also got armoured cars, not just 17th Battalion of the Tank Corps, um, also so from some other sources. So we've got breakthrough weapons, heavy tanks, the Mark V, and we've got exploitation um, weapons and arms, cavalry light tanks, medium tanks, and and, and, and armoured cars. And so we, we're starting to develop these all working together. We do similar things in the Middle East, but we don't have tanks in 1918 we, we've worked out that that it's all arms together it's not just all arms it's combined yeah, yeah. arms um although the terms sometimes get mixed up and then as you said in in in, in your intro um peace peace on earth um no war for uh, for 10 years we get was it 1924 the labor government um and not a criticism of the labor government but that, that is probably the most pacifist government of all time isn't it i think and so I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. Labour Party history as well as I do, or, or not as well as I do. Um, and, and so, um, yeah, never again. It's going to be at least 10 years. For Simon, when money, defence spending goes from, what, 700 million down to 120 million from 20 to 25, which isn't a surprise. It was so high because of the, 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 the First World War. Um, and then the role of the British Army changes. There's no war in Europe, so let's police the empire. Let's push east, or we're east anyway. I'm, I'm being a bit naughty because I'm slightly to, starting to make some slight comparisons with the challenge that the army and defence are going through right now. So you've got already things that can police the empire quite successfully. They are armoured cars and cavalry, and yeah, and yeah. you know the cavalry have been cutting about the Hindu coast, maybe not up the Kush, but but India uh, and the Middle East successfully for centuries. And throwing some armored cars, which have been used successfully in some quite rugged conditions. I mean, I mean, look at old um, Herman Dunsterville uh, and Dunster Force with, with with just a, a couple of armored cars in in, in Persia and and, and the Caucasus. Th these armored cars actually perform quite well. So you've got the capability, the equipment capability, to to police the empire to space them. And of course, aircraft are coming in, which can do it. So um, tank corps massively reduces in size. So we've gone from I think was it seventeen battalion, sixteen battalions with tanks and one with armoured cars in 1918, um, down to five by um, 1925, I think it is. Uh, and of those five battalions, one's a de uh, uh, the um, depot battalion, so it's not really a, a tank plan, it, it's training. So we've got four active battalions. That's, 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 almost a, you know, that's almost a fifth of what we had before. And we've got some armoured car companies, mainly in India and, and the Middle East. So, um, and then the cavalry amalgamate in 1920. So you've got all of this coming together Everything's getting smaller, and um, the equipment the equipment's a bit rubbish still. That's not to, to, to denigrate anybody who came up with those uh, Mark IVs and Mark Fives, but it's pretty fragile stuff. It's cutting edge for 1917, but it hasn't really been tried and tested beyond that. It hasn't been developed further. And so you end up with this sort of, well, stasis. It, it, it becomes difficult. So what is the political will? What is the, 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 what is the, the, what is it you're trying to achieve militarily? So how do you then design your force in terms of both structure and equipment and tactics and doctrine, which you then need to man and, 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 and train people uh, to do all that stuff and then supply it. So, um, and this is all going on in the twenties, but, uh, sorry, not but, and it gets confused by people with, ideas god damn those people with ideas um people with ideas go and shut up over there um because you're just annoying but 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 actually there's an element of truth in that you get these thinkers coming up people have grand ideas of how we're going to fight the next war and it starts during the first world war you get the tank corps headquarters you get fuller who's originally a lud infantry he's not some bucks lud infantryman um you get fuller you get martel who's a sapper um uh, originally, you get, um, and a couple of others, start thinking about armoured warfare, but they've gone all out on armoured warfare. Uh, Martel 
comes up with her, his his essay in, in in the late part of the, the the First World War, where everything's going to be done with tanks, and he's essentially designed a tank force, which is the Royal Navy, but with tanks instead of ships. So he's got little ships, he's got medium ships, destroyers and frigates, and he's got they come to battleships and everything, and he's even got torpedoes, land-based torpedoes. I have no this is idea. The era, to interrupt. This is the era because I'm from the printing background of oh, the Boys Zone yeah. Illustrated magazines full of lovely line drawings. You could design an aircraft, you could design ships, you could design tanks, you can get it out there. The Maginot line kind of suffers, I'm using the word, or, 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 or the opposite of suffers in that regard because little boys are picked buying these, these what are I since science magazines. So if you, if you, as you say, if you design some bit of kit, you can kind of get it to the civilian world first and then offer it to the military world What after you've kind of got it in science magazines. So that, there's lots of things going on there where people are being encouraged to give ideas, but what's leading what? Is our, our ideas leading the military doctrine or is, is military doctrine wanting steering where the ideas go? It, it well, I mean, the ideal mix is a bit of both. One leads yeah. the other. You then test a proposition, you then adjust, test a new proposition based on your, your your results of your previous proposition, whether it be doctrinal or equipment or both. Um, but you need a big vision. You know, what is it? What is the role of the army? Question mark. April twenty twenty one. Post um, independent uh, uh, inter uh, the review, the security and defence review, and the command paper of, of a few weeks ago. What is the point of the army? Well. They're asking the same question in, in, in the 1920s. And so, yes, it's the global policing bit, the empire policing. But you've got the likes of Fuller and a guy called Lindsay who's a tanky. And, and they are tank nuts. And to them, and to something like Martel, the answer is tanks. Now, what was the question? And everything can be done by a tank. You don't need infantry. You don't need um, – you need some artillery to some extent. But, but these tanks are going to go off. Huge gangs of them having broken through uh, in places, but not, not breaking through the main defence, having found a way through somewhere else to then go and do damage in the, in, 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 in the, op, um, in the enemy's rear area. So this is a strategic force um, that, that, that will not be involved in that, that classic traditional attritional breakthrough battle. It's going to find a way through somewhere else and, and go stuff. That main battle is still going on, um, I don't think Fuller was saying that that wouldn't happen, but he wants to go and look at tanks doing something different. And so you get this, 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 this tank is not what it is today. It is not an anti-tank weapon but for a number of reasons. First of all, it's not designed to be an anti-tank weapon because I say it's going to go off and do stuff um, in the rear area. So it's going to attack logistic nodes. It's going to attack um, headquarters, cut off the head and the body fails. Um, the enemy. Well, it's still the Germans. I think we all know that. I think we, we think we're reconciled to the fact that the French are our buddies uh, at that by by that stage and, and are going to stay buddies. So so that's all good. Um, Germans. Well, they're not the enemy in such because they're not going to rearm because Versailles said so. So they're not going to be building tanks. So therefore, we don't need quite so. We don't need tanks to be anti-tank weapons. We've never really had that thought. We, we we've created guns on the tanks that can hit a hardened target like an armoured car. So we've got shot, um, you know, metal shot, dense metal shot, which will go through uh, a, a, an armoured vehicle, will go through some armoured plate. Um, and we've got some shell, small explosive stuff. But that's not what we're trying to do at this stage. Um, and it's not what we're trying to do for quite some time. And we'll talk in a bit, I think, perhaps, about the organisation of what the army comes up with by the mid-30s, late 30s, early 40s, in terms of a structure of the division. It's still not the tank that's going to be doing any anti-tank work because what are the tank? Well, who are we fighting against? You've got tanks, so you can sort of understand the thinking. I mean, I'm going to defend Fuller and and and, and perhaps Hobart as well because Hobart goes along with the, the the two pounder is is good enough. I don't know whether Fuller specifies a, a, a caliber as being good enough, but you can understand to some extent why they're saying, well, it's not anti-tank because. That role almost doesn't exist. There is no requirement, or not a great requirement, for an anti-tank weapon in the British Army because the enemy we're going up against aren't going to have tanks. I can so, see that being relevant in the early 20s, mid-20s, even late 20s. But I think 
when you get to the early 30s, I think the writing on the wall becomes a little bit more obvious about what's going, where the direction armored warfare might be going. But yeah, we are talking about a lot happening over 20 years. It is quite a long time. I mean, that's a generation of thinking. And during that time, there's going to be senior officers retiring and dying and new officers coming through. So it's not like we're talking one group of people who are dealing with this problem. This is going to be two, maybe three generations of people who are tackling the interwar period and therefore three potential sets of ideas um, and 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 ways forward. So let's kind of break it down a little bit. Well, when I say we, we, we you will break it down a little bit more in time let, let, and talk about the types of tanks and where things are going and, and indeed where you think the mistakes are being made. Um, well, can, can we just backtrack just to, yeah, to what sure. you're saying? The, 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 you mentioned about the fact that, it, you know, in the 20s, you can understand it, but perhaps by the 30s, late 30s, it, it's, it, it's less understandable. I, I think that's right. I think part of the, the issue is that the great thinkers, um, they're all First World War veterans, or the majority of them. Those in the tank corps who have not been, uh, were not in the Great War, they come in pretty early on in the, the, the 20s into this newly formed um, tank corps, or oh, sorry, Royal Tank Corps in 1923. So. Um, They've been brought together. I mean, Hobart comes across from elsewhere. Lindsay comes across. A whole heap of them come from outside with this 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 vast amount of first world experience, which is break through the main defence. But they they don't want to do that. They want to go and do something else. Um, come to tanks in a minute. Let, let's just can we just talk about how the experiments came about? Because you you very kindly put armoured experiments yeah. up there as, as the title. Um, and, and and that's an experiment that's going on. And, and just, just to interrupt you just as well, just because it's just going to come up. I'm the Craig. Craig Farrow just asked a question, although I'm actually going to ask a different one. Okay. Um, we've also got knowledge. You, you mentioned about the merger and amalgamation of the cavalry regiments, but also losing that tradi tradition is a big part of it as well. Isn't it? There, there's a whole swathe of what we've been doing for hundreds of years that will have to come to an end in some ways to, an to enable the armoured warfare to progress forward. So there's a traditional tradition element that is also a fact here that you know, we don't want to see our lovely horses go, even if we know they may not be as relevant. That's a big, that's a big um, psychological hurdle to overcome at this period as well, isn't it? Well, it is. Your whole your, your, your whole being is predicated on horses. If you're a cavalryman, yeah. I mean, absolutely everything. It, 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 without the horse, although cavalry by post Boer War they reform, uh, and you know, Hague plays a part in that. By the, the the first war, the cavalryman is 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 an incredibly well trained. Um, soldier he can fight mounted and dismounted he's very versatile problems yeah. there aren't very many of them in a regiment you need lots of them to hang around with the horses if you do go dismounted so um yeah the, 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 the thousands of years cavalry equals horses that the, the, that's the whole point so yes you're absolutely right um it was bad enough in 1922 the amalgamate i think we lose about eight regiments so so um this is when we get all the 13th, 18th, and 15th, yeah. 17th, all that. That's Absolutely. It's, it's all of the, well, 16th, 17th, 21st, 13th, 18th, 15th, 19th, 14th, 20th. They yeah. all come about then, plus the, the Carboneers, who eventually go on to amalgamate the Scots Greys, the, the 4th, 7th, um, and, and the 5th Inner Skillin, the 5th Skins. They all come about uh, from that time. Names that, that most of which we, we know from, certainly from Normandy and other um, um, parts of the, the the Second World War uh, in detail. I mean, uh, yeah, fourth, seventh, um, the fifth skins, um, thirteenth, yep. eighteenth, uh, all have a, a successful fight in Normandy. I would argue. Um, so that's happened. Um, I think some of them are reticent. Some of them do see um, machinery as a bit scary. Uh, there are a few lines in in a couple of books about some of these soldiers, frankly, were just not suited to anything mechanical. And, and even in the mid-20s, um, one or two of them might have been in a, in a lorry a truck uh, at some stage during the First World War if they're an old soldier. But actually, some of them might have been on a, some agricultural machine. Um, some of them might have been on a bus or a tram. But, but they were not skilled in, 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 in these vehicles. There was no selection. And so um, there was an unhappy marriage to some extent. But the cavalry knew. These were professional officers. And yes, we have the cavalrymen who can be a bit cavalier. They are polo playing. They are partying. They may come from the, the public schools and the wealthier backgrounds, um, but they're not stupid. And they know that, that there's a right. And they want to be at the forefront. They don't want to be followers. 
they want to be leading the charge, if you pardon the cavalry pun. And so you're mechanising. Um, and they're given armoured cars and light tanks. Well, actually, they're quite exciting. Because mm. an armoured car, whether it be a, a, a Lanchester, the, which are the six-wheeled ones, um, I'm not sure if any of the cavalry do get the Rolls Royce. I think some of those stay with the, the, the RCR, but you know, maybe they get that. Um, the light tank, we'll show some photos of it, they're actually quite fun. They're almost, you can see them as a bit of a replacement for a horse. Yes, they need different levels of work on them. But a farrier, a farrier is not just a, 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 a farrier is not an unskilled worker. They might be strong in arm to, to do the, the, the work on the hot shoes, but, but it is a skilled art. And so actually, to me, non-horsemen, can't stand the things, there is a, there is a logical move from, from, a, from a horse born regiment into armored cars or, 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 or light tanks. And so but I think you know, we need we need to just emphasize again. It is an entire shift of culture as well as the military, isn't it? I mean, James Holland talks about that yeah. with his in World War Two with how few Germans had driven cars by 1940 compared to, for example, the USA, where many more people had grown up with garages and mechanics and able to understand those things. You know, you're you're talking about a whole society of Britain that are familiar with horses that they aren't today. You know, people growing up with them, they're on the farms, they're on the, you know, my granddad was still managing a farm in the fifties and sixties. that was still predominantly horse. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's still, it's a whole cultural shift towards mechanics. It's going to happen. To, yeah. It's going to need to happen. I mean, let's face it. We are our own, we're the cause of it. The, the industrial revolution started in Great Britain, I would argue. So we're, we're, we are the cause of all of this, everything that's happening. But, but we're, we're going along railway with it. lines. It's all our fault, isn't it? Well, we're going along with it, if not leading it. I mean, yeah. as, as you know full well, and, and James, I'm sure, would have mentioned this many times, and other uh, others on here. The German army of 1940. How many horses have you got? Um, yeah. They don't actually have that many Panzer divisions. Um, well, it's still 800 horses per division in Normandy in 1944. So yeah, exactly. So. There you go. And so, so actually, the British are well ahead of the game. And so, again, yeah. the cavalry deserve um, a credit for this, I think. And, yeah, there were some um, old-style cavalry officers who just didn't get it, or, or, or not because they were anti, but just it didn't equate. It, they'd been so ingrained with horses for so long. Although, you know, I guess if you Downton Abbey, if you're, if you're from the Downton Abbey class, you might have ended up in a cavalry regiment, well, you had a car because you got chauffeured about. And so I'm pretty sure it was exciting. And so yeah. why wouldn't you want to be part of that? And so I think I think some of the things I said about the cavalry not wanting to mechanise is unfair. I don't think there was institutional resistance. Yes, there was some. I mean, there's, there's some wonderful uh, poems, and I'm not going to recite some of them to you now, but from, from regimental journals of the, the 20s and 30s saying, you know, we're never going to take on... Um, smelly old tanks, we're going to stick with our horses, and, 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 and there's lots of sad descriptions of, of regiments you know, shooting their horses, having to give them up. They were allowed to hang on to a certain number, and, and the deliberation about which ones they're going to keep, and so on. So there is that. But, um, and I think this is led from the top. Um, Montgomery Massingbird. Field Marshal Montgomery Massingbird becomes CIGS in the 33, 34, something like that. I mean, he sounds, he's, I think he was a horse gunner. He sounds like he's, he's absolutely the, 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 the epitome of a First World War general, which is very rude on First World War generals. I know that, and I'm sorry to them. Um, but, but just, just in terms, but no, he's not. He's not, he's not, yes, it must be mechanized, go for it. But he's, he is pushing it along. He is encouraging it, um, although he is perhaps talked down. And the pol political side and the financial side go against it because, um, Tanks cost quite a lot uh, to produce. But there's an interesting bit here. One of Fuller's arguments for going for tanks rather than men is that tanks ultimately are cheaper than men. And that if we go for a tank force, you don't need tens of thousands of soldiers. You can get rid of them. So get rid of soldiers to pay for equipment. Now, government accounting is very, very dull. But there is a system that there is stuff that's resource and there's stuff that's capital spending. Soldiers are paid out of resource. I'm talking about today. Yeah, um, yeah. Tanks are bought out of capital spending. And basically you get given a lump of each. Every department gets given a lump of each to go and do its stuff with. Um, places like the Foreign Office have lots of resource because they have a few people, but very little capital because they don't have to go and buy much. Um, Ministry of Defence needs quite a lot of capital to buy aircraft carriers and F-35s and helicopters and, and, and tanks. 
And, and that's why we keep getting smaller, the army. Uh, because you, you, the government accounting allows you to reduce your resource spending in order to spend more on capital. So you can get rid of men and women to buy tanks and ships. You can get rid of oh, horses, an interesting one, because I think they would have been capital or their resource. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You can't get rid of tanks to buy more people. So you've got a similar argument goes on, or well, similar situation happens today, but, but um, Fuller was actually arguing this as a, as a, as a principle. Um, it's happening today as a sort of, as a reaction to the fact there isn't enough money for capital. So um, we've suddenly got ahead of ourselves. I didn't get, don't mean to get yeah, too well, into 2021 yeah, and, yeah. And, and the politics. And um, can we go back to experiments? Because yeah, yeah. that, that's what it said on the, the, the tin. And actually the experimental idea comes about, I've forgotten, I was just checking my notes earlier uh, today. It actually is first proposed by Fuller, funny enough, in, in 1924, as early as that. And in late 26, I think it is, the Secretary of State for War, and don't ask me who it was at the time, um, they form an experiment. He suggests, um, uh, no, he decides, it's actually a decision, that they're going to form this um, experimental force. But, but straight away, we get that um, tension coming in. I think the War Office wants to, you know, try a few things out slowly, maybe try a few tractors whether they're tracked or wheeled, to replace horse-drawn things, maybe try a few more lorries, maybe try some tankettes and carrier, tankette being a tiny little tank with a bit of tin plate on. Whereas Fuller, he wants to go all out, doctrine, equipment, tactics, boom, let's let's do it, let's do the whole thing. And 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 so you get this, there's a tension straight away there, um, and then we get the disagreement, the first disagreement on the composition. Um, Chief of the Imperial General Staff back then is Milne, I think. He wants all arms. Um, so not necessarily, he's not using the term combined arms at this stage, but but I think in principle he means the same. So working together, supporting each other. Um, for the Lindsay, they want armoured vehicles, which they mean tanks, maybe some carriers for scouting, but 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 essentially that's what they want. And and they become tank zealots. Well, tank I mean, tank evangelism sounds good. But they become tank zealots, and and you know what it's like. Whether they're they're, they're radicals, but they become zealots. They become fanatics. It's a bit like in politics, whether they're on the left or it doesn't matter where you sit. When you start becoming, they become bores almost. That's my word. Um, because then they're, they're fixated on tanks, 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 or armored vehicles, armored vehicles, armored vehicles. That's all you need. Um, anyway. Um, they overcome some of these disagreements. Well, anyway, first of all, you know, Fuller's a, 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 a colonel at this stage, and CIGS is a, a, a field marshal, so <laughs> not that much of a disagreement, arguably. Um, Fuller is really against it. Fuller says combining infantry with um, with uh, uh, tanks is like shackling a cart horse to a tractor. Uh, but um, they push ahead, and the first trial, I think, the first experiment, is 1927. It's a tank battalion. Using, uh, I think the photograph we've got up there, I think that's a little bit later. I think that's 29, I think that's Okay, that would, that would make some sense. Uh, the medium, the medium mark two, that is in, 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 the fore, in, in the foreground, that's clearly on the wrong side of that fence, isn't it? Uh, I don't know how he's going to get through there. It goes through it a minute. In the, in the film, it just goes straight through it. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's interesting. I, I'd have thought he might mess around with the track. So, uh, tank battalion, one machine gun battalion in lorries. And then some motorized field artillery gunners, sat, sorry, they are gunners, sappers, signals, and so on. So, so no dismounted infantry. So they have gone for this more mobile, um, no infantryman approach. There's a lot of criticism of the first uh, the first experiments. They're accused of just taking what was done before and deleting horse, inserting carrier, deleting foot, inserting lorry, and so they 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 carried out their their their, their tactics as if they were the old force, but just using some new equipment. And, and Little Hearts, a, a, a bit of a critic of that. He says, says it, was, it was traditional, it was not uh, revolutionary. But I, th I, think, I think Little Hearts being a bit unfair, because you've got to start somewhere. And so going from on foot or on horses to, to, to those sort of things in 1929, you say, that's a big leap, I reckon, even when you take into account that we did have quite a few tanks in 1918. I think there's a big step. So you've got to start somewhere. And as a start point, I don't think it was fair to make the criticism um, that were made. I think 
in a couple of years' time, that criticism is valid because the whole experimental force peters out and folds and they don't know how they're going to go and do the experiments to work out where they need to go to. And so, but I think back then it was a bit unfair. But anyway, lots of discussions on, on, on tanks and um, what they can do, which leads us into 1931. And it's the 1931 experiment, which, which sort of brought about how I'm here tonight talking about this rather than some of the other stuff we discussed. Because about a week ago, 10 days ago, you put out on Twitter that anybody actually on a battlefield that can go and do something real on a real battlefield um, for, for Tank Week, your, your sort of plea. And I can understand that. You're the, I think you're about the only person who seems to be getting anywhere near a battlefield at the moment, Woody. And, well, I live on one. Yeah. Yeah, I know. But you have that. Well, well, it suddenly occurred to me I live on one. I live, I reckon I live, and it's it's 500 meters in that direction there, and we'll see some video in a minute. I reckon I live um, 500 meters from the patch of ground that has been more fought over by tanks than any other bit of ground anywhere ever. Yes, there were more tanks in the whole of Kursk in 43 than have driven over this bit of ground. But the bit of ground I'm talking about is Salisbury Plain Training Area, and, and it is literally 500 meters up there. And it was the site, well, it's been a training area since since before the First World War on and off, but it, it, it grew massively in the First World War and the Second World War it grew as well. But in the 30s, quite a lot of the, the, the experimentation force um, tank activity took place uh, just over there. And the 1931 experiment, they, they, they one of the books I read years ago referred to the Battle of Till's Head. Well, Till's Head's the village um, three miles up the road. And so um, I suddenly thought, hold on. I'm on a battlefield here. Let, let, let's, let's see if we can do a live one. And when we worked out, and you were quite right, because I had a, had a go yesterday, far too windy up there. Um, and we wouldn't have got any benefit from that. Um, but um, I, I think, do you want to talk about 1931 and the experiment? Yeah, and, let's, put and, up. let's put the video up. So for those yeah, who, I, who've, who've never seen Salisbury Plain, um, you know, it is, well, as you see, you, you summed it up perfectly. It is the place where so much of British tank doc doctrine has been, is, and will be determined. It is, <laughs> it is the proving ground. It is the Aberdeen proving ground. It is the, it is the, it's where everything gets done. So um, we'll just play this. So it's silent, folks, about four minutes. And this is thanks to Gareth for taking this footage. So if you've never seen this, this here it is. So um, I mean, I'm, I'll, I'll explain sort of various bits and pieces. I'm now, that's the top of Breach Hill looking uh, over to the, hold on, northeast, southwest, west towards uh, Warminster. So um, the experiment in 1931, um, two and five RTR on, on the, 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 the friendly side, uh, three RTR on the enemy side. And three RTR are essentially where we're looking now, forming uh, a, a ring up on the high ground, including over to um, Long Barrow, which is right in front of us now. Uh, a mixture of medium tanks, probably Mark ones and twos by this stage, and uh, uh, carriers, you know, what, what you and I would perhaps call a brain gun carrier now, but a, yeah. a predecessor. Salisbury Plain would have looked very much like this. Okay, these are these are the the, the, the evergreen woods are post Second World War, uh, but but this is it. It's Chalkland. It's the same bit of chalk that 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 the Somme is on, uh, which is why uh, in many ways when you go to the Somme it looks like Salisbury Plain or, or vice versa. Uh, is this the same? That's the same bit of video. So. I may have put it in there twice, possibly. I don't it, know. It, it, it's wonderful rolling countryside. And it's great for, for charging around on. And if we were to go and fight a battle on the Somme, it'd be perfect for practicing here. But there's an argument that, that it's, it's not as representative of, of a battlefield for today. But it's only part of what the, the military is. Sadly, yesterday afternoon, there weren't any tanks out. There were just some lorries going along the convoy. But there, there, there is some uh, military activity. And this is a place called Breakheart Bottom. We're looking about north. Now, so three RTR uh, were pushing up where those lorries were, and two and five RTR were coming from the bottom. Uh, any military watching this who've had anything to do with tanks will know uh, Breakheart Bottom well. And uh, again, looking back to these, it just shows again the the, the rolling uh, countryside. It's it, it's grazing countryside because it's a bit rubbish for for crops. That's why it exists, and that's why it stayed. Uh, untouched the way it was and in, at, at the turn of the, the 20th century, which enabled the military to buy up lots of it. And this, this that's all grazing. The, the, the stripes are, um, the, the palms are going to put some cows on there, um, shortness of sheep on there shortly. Mm -hmm. And this is now looking back from the village uh, up to the hill. And 
that wood there you're looking at in the front now that was planted to, to give a, a covered approach to Cope Hill Down, which is the sort of German village that we can see right in the center of the screen now. Uh, two and five RTR are coming from across that hill. That's Breach Hill. Three RTR, three not RTR, RTC are where I, I where the, the camera is and uh, moving up there. And, and this is only just part of, of the battle. Um, it goes on a bit bigger and it's fairly inconclusive little battle, but uh, the Battle of Till's Head. Um, I think this is the same one again. I, don't, I think no, should be this. Oh, back again. Okay, so I mean, uh, you know, we 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 we've got the the, the picture. So three RTR. Um, I think what I was trying to show there is that slightly different angle. You can hide quite well on sort of on this rolling countryside. Uh, and and what I was wondering whether it'd be possible to do one day is to sort of go out with my step ladder and, and show you the difference in what you can see from a from hull. Turret up, turret down, hold down, all those sort of various tank positions. But um, that, that was not going to happen yesterday. So 1931, there's an there's experiment there. And this is, this is mechanizing the main force. This is a smaller experiment, 1931. This is looking at a, an armored division. Or actually, this is looking at a tank brigade. The, the names change. And in parallel, we've got the, 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 the cavalry um, mechanization going on which we talked about already and the two are not really part of the same at the whole time they're not fully integrated all the way through uh, by the time that video uh, the, by the time the experiment 91 took place we've got at least two cavalry regiments uh, mechanized uh, length Zars and the 12th lancers both become armored car regiments uh, and as you know and as lots of people listening know both both the 11th Zars and the 12th lancers are armored car regiments um, throughout the Second World War and, and have a good record um, throughout, I think. And I think the, the reaction initially negative, we, we talked about this already, but but they soon took to it. Um, they have some in, then The instructors are mainly tank corps because until this stage, the tank corps have also been doing uh, armoured cars, light tanks and the, the, the medium. So we've been doing everything uh, as tankies. Uh, and a couple of people who have been mentioned in, in the records, Pip Roberts, Captain Pip Roberts mm -hmm. is one of the... I think he might, yeah, Lieutenant Pip Roberts at this stage, uh, who goes on to command 11th Armoured Division, uh, age goodness knows what, uh, not very old. And then you get um, Roby, Robbie Uniaki, who um, ends up commanding 5RTR, is killed, is one of two commanding officers that 5RTR that uh, lose in the Second World War. I think Uniaki is killed in the, the, in, um, in the desert. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, there are very few photos of him. And on the side, General Sir Robert Corbett, who was the last GOC Berlin, is his nephew, has just found a whole load of photographs in a, in a family album. I mean, General Sir Robert, um, I guess he's in his 80s now. He, he has just got in contact with the, the, the RTR with these photographs, which is, which is fantastic news. But that's a complete diversion. So 31, that experiment. Going on to 35, um, we've got more experiments go on. And they decide they're going to, create two cavalry brigades, mechanized cavalry brigades. And so we've got cavalry brigades one side and we've got tank brigades coming along as, as separate entities. And the cavalry brigade is going to have two motorized cavalry regiments, which use sort of a, um, a Morris Dragon or um, sort of stripped down lorry, which you could argue that none of the, the, the light cavalry regiments have something similar today in the, the um, mm -hmm. um, I've completely forgotten the name of the vehicle they've got, um, doesn't matter. And um, so it's it's you know it's, it's, it's a bit like the long range desert group in in the Second World War. Cut down truck, you can fight mounted, but you've got it. You're carrying a couple of men, or you can jump off and, and fight. And, and one light tank regiment. And there are subtle differences with the, the ones in Egypt because we've got slightly different organisations out in the Middle East. So we're reorganising the army, but we're doing it differently in different theatres. So India's carrying on doing what India does. The Middle East were subtly changing, or, or we're going with one uh, order of battle, one structure for, for, for brigades and divisions. And in the UK, we're doing so something subtly different. And um, where have we got to? 1930s? Yeah, 30. Well, just to interrupt for a second. Yeah, so yeah. By this point, by 1931 35, I can hear myself yeah, echoing through your speakers again now. Anyway. Um, um, how did vehicles 
development go along with a doctrinal change? Which is leading which at this point? Because we're now starting to get the different classifications of vehicles, which we'll go into. We've got some photos to show folks in a minute because the 20s was kind of a bit random, but by now there we are going in certain ways with infantry tanks and cruisers and light tanks and medium tanks. But what's what's happening first? Is it doctrine dictating vehicle design or vehicle design dictating doctrine or a bit of both? Or is, I, it, is that too complicated a question? I, I'm going to take the cop out answer and say it's a bit of both. And and you end up with these. Let's say we've had these different ideas. The tank force become a cavalry force, and I like the term cavalry because there is a traditional role. I think I think it makes sense. Um, but the, the, there is this need to support the infantry, and so we we started. We have medium tanks. After the first of all, we have well, medium Mark A at the top, the whippet. Is that a cavalry tank? Is it an exploitation vehicle? Is it a medium tank? Who knows? We use it as a sort of, it's referred to by tankies of the 3rd and 6th battalions during the First War as a light tank, but its designation is medium. At the bottom, we've got a medium Mark II, as you can tell by the, the skirts. Um, and um, in, in the 30s, somewhere uh, abroad, that's a medium tank. But we haven't got really any other heavy tanks at that stage. Medium because it's not light and it's not, massively heavy so medium comes about as a sort of default designation because it's not heavy and it's not light oh it must be a medium rather than any clever thinking let's have a heavier medium and a light force so we've got medium tanks um what's the next slide please paul we've got light tanks there's a there's a night lancers light tank pre second world war and there's um that's um the bottom one is is of the third hussars in uh, North Africa in, I think that's late 1940, that photo's taken. So, so that the does yeah. look sexy. Pardon? I mean, that you can, I can see the cavalry, the former cavalry guys embracing that kind of concept because uh, that, that looks cool. That, I, yeah. that, that, that photo there defines why, if I was a young guy in 1931, that would look appealing to go into that kind of move, movement and direction of, of, well, you can do that with vehicles. That's, uh, that's I know you're saying that photo itself is 1940, but you know what I mean. That yeah. sense yeah. of being able to do that kind of thing with tanks. That's good. That's sexy. That's fun. And and at this stage, we've got cavalry regiments with these, and we've got tank corps uh, companies with light tanks. So we're, we're both doing the same role at this stage. But in the 30s, we get this bifurcation of role coming about because for a number of reasons. One is, with, yeah, it is doctrinal. We need a tank to be able to support the infantry onto an objective. And whilst Fuller and the likes don't necessarily see this as a, a role for tanks, it, it, it's there by necessity. Everybody says, hold on, hold on, you know, I'm the infantryman. You want me to go and storm that position. I need some mobile fire support. And, and these are there to provide exactly the same role that that First World War tank does. What did I say it was? The object of the tank is to help the infantry forward, especially to deal with machine guns. Well, top left, Matilda 1. Um, I mean, it's tiny, but it's quite well armoured. It's not very fast. It can move at the pace of an advancing infantryman. It's quite well armoured. It's got a machine gun. So it can support the infantry against an enemy um, machine gun. And so this comes about because you can't combine, which we're going to come to next, that, that fast, long-range tank with heavy armor at this stage. Top right metal to two, the, the, the improved one. Um, a few at Arras in 1940, uh, not many uh, with the seventh. Um, seventh also have them out in, in 1941. The seventh are about 80 years ago this week to, to go and reinforce Tobruk and end up, um, well, ceasing to exist as a result of the end of Tobruk. 80 years ago as well, BSCON 4RTR I've just used their, I think they've got 11 Matildas in um, East Africa. Uh, successfully and so we, we, we use those in, in in weird and wonderful place and we're about to have them there's going to be a troop of them in crete 80 years ago this summer so the the matilda actually gets about quite a bit so aras north africa um east africa and and, and crete oh i've lost you sorry is the great dominion correct in saying the mark one is a cruiser the mark two is infantry tank in the with the matilda no no they're both 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 infantry tanks um, right. bot bottom left, um, um, Valentine, a bit of a, bit of a, hmm. curate's egg, isn't that the right word? I don't know. It's a bit of everything. Um, it's actually quite well armoured. It's an infantry tank, but it's quite fast. 
So arguably, if it had a decent gun on it, rather than that two pen, we'll come to two pen in a minute, it, it, it could do all roles. And I, I think it was Al Murray who said, oh, does that make it an MBT? Uh, when we were having a chat on, on, on Twitter a month ago. And I, I'm tempted to say, yeah, Al actually probably does. And then the, the Churchill bottom right, traditional infantry tank, heavily armoured, um, slow trundling, can go anywhere uh, alongside infantry. So I think it's a bit of doctrine or, 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 or philosophy even that ends up with the, 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 the equipment following, uh, but also the fact that you can't have a universal tank, the one that Monty wants. You're going to have to have some slightly specialised armour. If you want to go slowly, toe-to-toe, -to -toe, with a heavily defended position, supporting our infantry onto the position, you need something that's well armoured. And it doesn't need to go fast, hence the infantry tank. And those are four examples there. Uh, if you want to go zoom, zoom, round the, round the back, um, through the little gap, and destroy the rear area, well, you need the cruiser tank. And that's probably the next slide. Yeah, so there we are, some cruisers. A9 at the top. And um, yeah, we lose a few of those at uh, in Cali in in 1940. Eighty years ago this week, um, there are two. Well, there's only about ten of them left at this stage. BNC Spons three RTR are withdrawing through Greece in in ten or fifteen of, of those ones that they've inherited from five or six RTR, they're 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 broken, they're worn out and they haven't got the right spares. And poor old three RTR, who've lost a whole load of these in, in Calais, had a brief poor time with them, are now having to, to do the same again in, in Greece, uh, putting a valiant effort. At the bottom, there's some cruisers. I never remember what they are, Paul. Um they're just cruiser tanks, rubbishy cruiser tanks. Valentines and whatever, yeah. I mean it's I mean at what at what point sorry, do we also does the world learn about that? You you mentioned it yourself in a, a few seconds ago in that with armour, as in with infantry, it's balancing defence, firepower and mobility, isn't it? as it is with infantry. We learned that thousands of years ago yeah. with hoplites can move fast, but they haven't got armour. Roman yeah. legions have lots of armour, but they can't move fast. How much stuff do you carry? How much stuff do you... Yeah. When do we kind of get to grips with that with regards to tanks? Is it the 30s where that we really start realising you can't have a tank that does everything? Well, I think we've known that all along because engine technology is as it is. Uh, well, I can't remember the facts and figures about what the size of the engines of these tanks is and, and, and what they, they produce in terms of horsepower. So in, in terms of specific output, but if you look at a, a, a Mark IV tank from the First World War, uh, it produces 105 horsepower, but it's, I don't know, eight litres or something. It's huge, uh, the tank. And... Uh, trying to propel something that weighs 25 tonnes with 100 horsepower. My, you know, my, my Golf has got 100 horsepower, but it only weighs a tonne. So I, I can't remember the specific outputs of these, but it, but it, it is because of that realisation as well. You can't do it all with one machine. You're going to end up with these different machines. And, and you can argue that other nations do something similar. The, 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 the Soviets with a T-34 and a, and a, and a JS or, a, or the KV series, the, the, the Germans with, well, Panther's a medium tank, but, but the Tiger, a heavy tank. Um, and um, they, of course, go down a slightly different route because they've got tank destroyers and assault guns, which which is sort of confusing, but in many ways is quite a clever move because they they realise even further you can't do it with just one or two tanks. You need to go into to different designs. And it's not until, well, Centurion. Centurion is probably the first tank that can do it all, but if one's being, I think a Comet would have had a good go at being a, an MVT. Big fan of it. A comet. Comet's good tank. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and and there's a once we get to Cromwell, Cromwell Comet Centurion, Chieftain Challenge and Challenge Two, there's a, there's an obvious progression through with all of those. Uh, can we just go on a couple of slides? Let's 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 just some light tanks. There's a, a you know a, a, a Vickers light tank at the top and a, and a some version of a Stuart or a Honey. It's probably an M3 or oh, I don't know. And you can see the progression. You can see you can see where things are going. You can see the direct lineage there, even though they're completely independent mm -hmm. in design. You can see the types starting to uh yeah. starting and, to become clear. And if I'm being my, my pedantic usual self, the, to me the term light tank is 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 nonsense. That you know a tank is to me something that can support infantry against uh, the enemy and also destroy enemy tanks well clearly light tanks can't but but i can live with it that's the photograph i wanted to bring up that's a two pounder that's our main anti-tank weapon it almost all of those british tanks we've just shown there really i've got a two pounder in them um, and if it's not in the photo they will have had a two pounder at some stage in a previous mark 
We also use the two-pounder as our main anti-tank weapon, towed anti-tank, wheeled by the Royal Artillery. And we've got one anti-tank regiment from the Royal Artillery in, 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 in our uh, armoured divisions. And it's, what, 40 millimetres? Because we, well, the, the baddies don't have tanks, so we don't need to have an anti-tank weapon. And then people like Hobart saying it's fine, not help that after um, Arras, uh, the, 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 the report from the Army Corps says, Two panda is just about okay, but we need to get on with something else at some time soon. I paraphrase. So we're stuck with this pop gun for far too long. Some people say, well, why don't you just put a new gun in? Well, you can't. And look, okay, the angle's a bit deceiving, but um, if you make the gun a bigger caliber, so this goes from, from take it from a 40 mil to a 76 mil, 17 pound. Uh, you make the shell wider, but you're going to make it longer as well because you need more propellant. Mm. To make the, the the thing go at the right speed to penetrate a, a, a tank, which make which means you can't load it, um, and it can't recoil because there's not enough space behind where his hand is at the back of that shell to, to load it into the gun. So you have to make the turret bigger. As you know, with the the the, the Sherman um, Firefly, they have to put the radios in the box on the back to yeah. do just that. Uh, if you make the turret bigger, one way is, is literally make it bigger, but the turret ring becomes bigger, the circle that it sits on on the hull which means you've got to make the hull bigger. And you can't just make the hull bigger in one direction because if you get the length and width out of kilt, it won't turn properly. So you have to make the whole thing bigger, which means it needs more armour on it. If you put more armour on it, it, it will weigh more, which means it'll be slower. So you need a bigger engine. So you put a bigger engine in, but you'll need a bigger fuel tank because the bigger engine will use more fuel. So having put a bigger fuel tank in, you probably need some bigger armor as well for that. And so you get the spiral down. And, and, and engine technology is, is not keeping up with it until we get um, the, 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 those wonderful, um, based on the aviation engines, the Rolls Royces going in, uh, in into the, the, is there one in the Cromwell? I should know that, but certainly Comet and, and, and onwards. So it's technology that limits you. So even if they did want to, to go down this route of the universal tank, which I think has been talked about. They, they just can't do it. Nobody can do it technologically. It's just not possible. So you end up with this two infantry tanks, which are all crewed by the RTR, and cruiser tanks, which are crewed by a mixture of cavalry and uh, the RTR. And it sort of makes sense in that the, the infantry tank, the role is exactly the same as a First World War tank. Smash through, supporting the infantry. Trundle, 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 working with the infantry. Cavalry tank has, oh, sorry, cruiser tank, slip of the tongue, but perhaps should be called a cavalry tank, maybe, has the sort of traditional cavalry role. But at some stage, we have to change our thinking and become this more aggressive force that can also do a bit of toe to toe with an enemy force. And that's what we haven't perhaps uh, come up with. And um, someone just mentioned also the um, when we get into bigger vehicles. We're at, we're going into the realm of what the engineers can do as well, because again, if we're, if we're going forward on a combined all arms front, and we've got to have bridges, we've got to have this that that's changing that aspect as well. So, if we push too far forward in any one of these regards, be it guns, armor, we're 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 leaving the other areas behind. It's always going to be about compromise all the way through the thirties, isn't it? I mean, same same with aviation. I'm I'm thinking really until we kind of. It's that mid-war period where you can see the aircraft in all that really kind of becoming dominant in their prescribed roles. Before that, there's always a compromise element, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned fuel. Um, Bowsers, the, 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 the more powerful the tank, the more fuel it will use, therefore you need more Bowsers. What is your standard jerry can in 1940? It's the flimsy. The flimsy is rubbish. It leaks like bilio. And so bringing up fuel from um, from from... Uh, Cairo, Alexandria, up to the front in 1940, uh, as we start that limited raid, as apparently uh, it was. Um, only half the fuel gets through because it's just leaked or evaporated away. And so you need to change your supply chain. You need, if you're, you're going further, you need to take your, cat, your, your guns with you. And so, of course, they need uh, to be mechanised. The ammunition needs to be brought along with them on a separate vehicle. If you put your if you put your guns on tracks, does your ammunition need to go on tracks as well? Or can you get a lorry bring it up? Well, if a lorry can bring it up, does the gun... Anyway, that's a... So, yes, it, 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 it's a spiral. Uh, and, and so, 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 we haven't mentioned radios yet, um, and, and yeah. we'll probably stay off that. But, of course, 
that brings in a level of complexity uh, as well and, and, and additional uh, requirements. So we've, we've done these experiments in the 1930s. You've, you've addressed some of these people. Well, we haven't gone back to Hobart particularly, but where, you, you know, you, you kind of dropped the, uh, the, 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 the time ticking time bomb at the beginning that you kind of didn't think the British army <clears throat> were quite as ready as they could be. So what, what, with the benefit of hindsight, with the benefit of 25 years career in the RTR and all the wow. reading you've done, where, where did we drop the ball? Where did the mistakes get made? And what should we have done in that kind of 30 to 39 period? Um, can I blame politicians? That's the easy way out, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I, I like but, that. That's good. Or, yeah, or, yeah, shall, just, I just, yeah. or, or shall, I, shall I blame the international world order? Because uh, a bit like 1914, we had the best trained and equipped army for a mobile war in Europe, but we didn't get that in the end. Uh, we, we didn't think we were going to have this war. And yeah, okay, Hitler doing his stuff, we perhaps should have seen some of it coming. But with the, with the fiscal envelope, whatever the buzzword people use today, with the amount of money we had, what was it? I, I, I got some figures, I never remember them. But 19th, uh, defense in 1930 was 13% of government spending. By 39, it'd become almost half. And, and you can see a rapid ramp up. But within uh, the army was, was a third of defense. So the army's not doing too badly, arguably in the 30s, in that it's getting a third of the funding. How big is the Air Force? How big is the Navy? Well, they cost money as well. And so they're getting a third. So you could argue it's fairly even. But in terms of the Army, oh, I haven't got the slide. But look at the figures which compare the amount we spend on horse food, fodder, and how much we spend on armoured vehicles. And whilst we are spending more on armoured vehicles than we are on fodder, at times the differential isn't perhaps as great as you might imagine. I mean, looking at these figures, Percentage of army expenditure on track vehicles in 1931 to 32 is under 1%. And it's still that figure until 34, 35. And then by 36 to 37, it's gone up to 1.5%. Wow. So the army is at fault somewhere. Is that because the army cannot make its mind up what it's going to, how it's going to organize itself? Does it want to be this empire policeman? these light forces overseas, perhaps working with um, indigenous forces or, or other in, 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 in local forces? Um, does it want to rearm to go and do um, peer on peer, near peer, uh, peer on near peer war? Uh, and it doesn't know. It's not helped by some of the arguments put about, as I said, by the Lindsays, by the Fullers, by the Hobarts, who are, I think, quite narrow-minded. They are using history to some extent to inform them. They're not just thinking about the present. They are trying to be informed by history, but I think they're drawing the wrong lessons from history. And they've gone down this tank only, tank only route. And and but then also got it slightly wrong in their tank only route in that they've ended up with these the the, the split of tanks. So and we can't make our minds up in the army. I mean the the, the army the armored division in 1934 had um, no infantry in it, the mobile force. It's essentially a divisional size. I'm just checking, yes, no infantry. It's a cavalry division with, with vehicles. Um, by 1939, the armoured division has two infantry battalions, not in the brigades. They're in a thing called the support group, which is a brigade-sized force where we group the sappers and the gunners and various other anti-tank regiments, anti-aircraft uh, batteries and so on. But it's not a brigade. It has two armoured brigades, one light, one heavy, um, but two infantry battalions. In April 1944, we still only got two infantry battalions. By late 1940, sorry, 1940, late 1940, we've got three infantry battalions and an armoured car regiment alongside the tanks. Uh, the number of tanks is going down. We start with 350. We're down to, by 42, uh, there are only 200 tanks in an armoured division, but we have got four infantry battalions. So we're, we're bringing up our infantry and reducing our tanks. And then by 44, as, as you know, those, those three main armoured divisions, um, well, uh, 7th, 11th, and um, guard, guards, 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 7th and, and 11th, 11th, sorry. Yeah. Um, they've got about 310 tanks, but that includes the Ricky Regiment, which is about 75 tanks strong. So it's, again, 240 tanks, three infantry battalions, plus a Ricky Regiment. So... Um, four infantry battalions, sorry. So, so, so we play with the structure the whole way through. We really haven't got it nailed down. And partly because money, 
partly because the army can't make a decision, partly because it doesn't know what to do with this government because it's new and it's finding its feet. And so, so some of it I excuse it um, entirely. Some of it, I'm afraid, um, I do blame a couple of people who wore the same colour berry that I wore, which is quite a thing to say. <laughs> But, but um, I mean, the thing is, when we took, well, I'll let you go, uh, elaborate on that a little bit. But, um, you know, in, in 1941, for example, the Rec Rec Reconnaissance Corps is created. We, you know, you, you just mentioned by 1944, we've got infantry battalions within armored red uh, armored division. We've got, but that's by then we know who we're playing in the final. We know which, which team we've drawn. Yeah. To, to yeah. be kind of devil's advocate here from the late 1930s, where, as you say, you made the very good point that we're still maintaining an empire we've still got an army in india and all around the world with a whole different set of problems as you said cavalry have been working there perfectly well for hundreds of years so it's it seems i'm going to use football as an analogy we're kind of assembling a squad but we don't know who we're going to have in the final are we going to be playing the silky smooth italians are we going to be playing a physical team we, we just until the until the, we get the draw and we, you know, we got the draw. We are. We've got Germany now. Then we can kind of adapt against that enemy. I can, I can see a lot of. And yeah, you're absolutely right. Sight, um, yeah. You, you never go to war with the exact team that you need to be fighting a war at day one. I mean, you could argue that 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 you know the BEF in 1914 wasn't far off what it needed to be, um, but things changed rapidly. The BEF in 1940, arguably wasn't the organization it needed to be because we just had um first army tank brigade four and seven rtr over there we didn't have any armored divisions over there uh, we bring across third armored brigade three rtr to Calais, and then we send second armored division um down uh to do the the, the second fight down on, on the somme um in 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 1940 post dunkirk so partly because we don't know where the, the threat is we've got an armored division in the middle east we've got some at home we we we, we we don't know where the fight's going to be, and we don't know who we're up against, as you say, and we haven't worked out what our possible team could be mm. and are able to quickly swap out that left back for a new goal attack. And our company director isn't giving the manager enough money to spend on new new players. We're going to continue the uh, the army uh, the football analogy as well, you know. And the new players you're getting, they're all a bit similar to the ones you had before, um, and we can't get that super duper faster yeah. one. So know. let's 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 you know. I think Hobart gets enough praise about the funnies and stuff. So what you know, you said a couple of people were were, were the wearer of black berets. So Hobart's one of them. So well, what did Hobart get wrong in this point? Well, I, I think he. I think we've said it already, but you know, on a, in, a, in a in a single quote, a soundbite kind of thing. Well, I think, I, think, I think Fuller is uh, sorry, Hobart. I think is is he's the man. He he's absolutely clear. Um, the, the, the his tank brigade, the role of armor is this strategic deep strike operations, and he sees no real need in that for other arms. And I think if you're going to do deep strike. You might not need other arms. I mean, in fact, the army's coming up with this new recce strike thing, which is is these new Ajax vehicles and, and a whole load of artillery. But for that deep strike, it was used in the Gulf thirty years ago, uh, an ad hoc uh, uh, grouping hadn't been tried for real. It, it probably does make sense, but that wasn't the only force that was needed, and so he was all out on that. Uh, as were, as I've mentioned, um, um, Fuller and Lin Lindsay actually changes. Lindsay goes about face because we bring together one of the, the tank brigade and infantry brigade as part of one of the experiments. Lindsay, by this stage, has become the commander of that infantry brigade. I don't know how they made that decision because on paper, with Lindsay with his tanks, tanks, tanks background, who decided to give him an infantry brigade? But but whoever did, actually, it was the right answer because he understood then um, by that stage that, oh, maybe I've got it wrong. But so it's it's, it's, it's men with that phrase. Um, Full is starting to go off the rails, and 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 I becomes a member. Does he does he join the fascist party? I think in the end, if he's not a member, he's a supporter. And and, and I think you and I have pretty similar views on fascists here, really. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, the, the, the other thing I'm thinking about is kind of I'm sorry, folks, if it's kind of dissolving into just me and Gareth chatting now. But I mean, that's <laughs> you know, people sat and watched me witter on for four hours on on Saturday night. So um, <laughs> the 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 thing about you know with with what your current job has is and what you've been doing it seems to me that over the years getting armor sorted out is still an ongoing problem it's a very difficult area to get right and when you, when you think about infantry a human being can 
within a six week course, take on a new idea quite quickly. But with the whole, as you've explained, with anything to do with armor, you've got that whole support element. You've got fuel, you've got logistics, yeah. you've got that. So changing a system over isn't just a case of giving everybody a month training. It's got, it's a whole evolution of everything behind it. So you, once you've committed yourself down a path, it's really difficult to suddenly change on that path. And given how much you've, you've learned over the years about this, it's the, the same problems are kind of still there, aren't they, really? I, I, think there are, I, mean, I think there are huge parallels between the 1930s and the 2020s and what the Army's trying to do. Um, reduce money. Army perhaps doesn't know what it's there for. Not necessarily the Army's fault. I hasten to add, you know, post-Afghanistan and Iraq, which... I think the public have largely forgotten, but the army is still beating itself up about too much. We've forgotten armoured divisions. Um, okay, we more armoured division singular. Uh, we, we, we think we need one of those, but we're going to try something else as well. But we also want to focus on our strategic interests, and, 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 and which again makes sense. Government has got this tool called the armed forces. Of course, it's going to use them for things other than war. I think it is quite difficult. I think the army needs to sit down and think about what exactly does it need to do and therefore what structures and equipment does it need to do that and then test them out. And it's going to do this. I think I, I, I don't know the detail, but having read uh, about the Defence Review, one of the things they've come up with is an experimental force. Now, um, whether that's going to test everything out or just some smaller stuff, I don't know. But I think the army absolutely understands the need for trying things out. I think it's got... A bit of room for manoeuvre, no pun intended, and it's going to go and find its way in a way that they didn't do in the 30s. They had some experiments and then stopped them, and they didn't know where they wanted to go to, and they didn't have a plan to work out how they might get to a place that they didn't want to go to, which some will say, well, hold on, if you know where I didn't want to go to, you can't work out a plan to get there. Yeah, but they weren't really playing around enough to work out where they could be going to, and so... I think I think the army do deserve the blame. And I think I'm afraid tank corps zealots didn't help the situation. Mm. But then to, to again to take the other point, the opposing view, we know that when yeah, we could argue about things in the war not developing perhaps as fast as they could have done, but the British Army does become a very efficient fighting force within a very short space of time. Look at what we did in Burma week, how quickly having been pushed out of Burma, we come back a completely reinvigorated, reinvented, rediscovered force. And look what we do in the, in the ETO. And so with, and I know a lot of that was wartime development, but we had, presumably a lot of papers had been filed in 1930. There was a lot of results and yeah. summaries have done of these armored experiments in 31 yeah. and 34 that we could then draw on and say, well, this definitely didn't work. And we yeah. tried that and it took us down a wrong. So I suppose if nothing else, it gave a bit of a database of, of previous experience. And you said, you said yourself earlier, you know, those early ones in the twenties, you know, you've got to start somewhere. You've got to yeah. do something yes. to work out what doesn't work. Yeah. So in order you can then find out what does work. So the so the thirties it was the well it was that pioneering era for armored warfare where lots of mistakes were made, but also lots of foundations were built for what then became sorted out later. You said yourself with the, the you know the, you, we when we see the 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 um the, the Cromwell and the Comet and the Centurion and all of that progression would have been impossible without the bad efforts in the thirties having paved that way. I, th I think you're probably right. Yes, and of course I'm being I'm being unfair because you know and 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 and, and going against Hobart because it's an easy shot and 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 I I like to to to, to knock him down slightly. I mean he had the easiest, the most tightly bounded problem of, of the whole war: get off the beaches. Um, and that's a really unfair thing for me to say about 79th Division, as you know. And in fact, my next talk I'm I'm doing one about. Um, uh, uh, assault engineers in Italy, which is essentially the same sort of people. It's tankies and sappers working to, to, together. Uh, but uh, he is idolised in many areas. I mean, this isn't Wittmann type stuff. Um, I mean, it's not daft like that. But but Hobart, many many good characteristics, of course. But I, I'm not convinced he was the the the, the brilliant um, thinker that some make out. I think there was a That's lot. That's a very of good point about the fact he was given a specific task to overcome. I've never thought about it in that way. That's an easier. Uh, 
Yeah, then just to say, we're going to have problems in the future. We don't know what they are. Come up with solutions. It's a much more broader yeah. and difficult thing to tackle than we've got a specific problem. Here is that. Like, like Churchill and the Mulberry Harbour. We want to have a harbour that we can take across. It's behind anyway, you. You've got the, you've got, with, yeah. with a starting point, it's very easy to then move off with that, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it, the screen behind you, that, that, that's all that he has yeah. to solve. Get off that beach. Yeah. Um, and I'm being very unfair by saying that. Of course I am. Uh, uh, one of the criticisms I think that people put against him is that he cheated at croquet. I think that's unfair because um, croquet is that wonderful underhand game where a little bit of creative play is, is needed. So I will I will defend just, Hobart on that one. Just um, I fear this is a rabbit hole we don't want to go down. But did did German military observers see what was we were doing in the thirties? Guderian people like that. I mean, I fear we end up starting out what the Germany are doing with their armoured. But it is interesting just to make note in the thirties. Were these things watched by other armies? I mean, we've had various people talking about what the American army were doing because they didn't have cruisers and infantry tanks. They had light, medium, and heavy. So, so um, in the thirties, were these were these international these training exercises? Were yes, did we invite others? I should know the answer about the Germans. I don't know. I I don't believe there was a huge amount of observation because because why would we let a German? whose army is prohibited from having these things, come and see what we're doing with them. We might want to do it for deterrence effect, but we can do that with a, the, the, um, an article in the the, the, the the Times of London or the, you know, mm. um, I mean, Pathé have quite a lot of film. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm, I struggle with that. I'm not unable to, I'm unable to use Pathé things because of copyright within my shows, but go on YouTube, folks. Pathé have a lot of 1930s, Newsreel stuff about tank 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 exercise in Salisbury. So presumably, if yeah. we let Pathé go there and film it, we knew that this is going to go yes. into the public domain, so to speak. I know we're not giving away all the secrets. There's lots of just look at these things running across fields. We're not explaining what they do and how they work and uh, and how we use them. But we 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 we're, we're showing some of the some of the stuff. So I, I guess that's great. You're absolutely right. There's some fantastic videos of uh, films of Stonehenge with tanks cutting around. Um, the, you know, the, 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 the Pathé reels in the 30s are, are, are brilliant, yeah, and well worth a watch. So, you know, so let's let's conclude with, in 1939, um, the British Army was had had what? Just in case people haven't been following what we're going, we've, we've got armoured divisions, um, and, yeah, break down what we actually had in 1939. Okay, in 1939, we've got um, things called Army Tank Brigades, which are infantry tanks, Matildas, Crewed by the newly formed Royal Tank Regiment, because we formed the Armour Corps in 1939, and um, it's essentially one battalion per division. They're known as Army Tank Brigades at that stage. We have got Armoured Divisions, which have cruiser tanks, plus a few light tanks in them, and some infantry, as we mentioned, plus some sappers and guns and so on. And they only have two brigades. And we also have some independent, we're about to form some independent armoured brigades. And they absolutely um, colour things differently and, and they make things awkward because they try to be a bit of everything. They try to be that um, cavalry tank cruiser type thing, but they also try and do a bit of toe-to-toe -to -toe with the enemy and, and suffer. And... Um, your comment earlier about how we developed in the Second World War, we learn and so on. Yeah, absolutely. And war is a wonderful way of experimenting because if you get it wrong, you die. So, yes, that sharpens the mind. But we're still being a bit cautious. And if you look at the three armoured divisions in 1944, they all develop slightly differently. <laughs> and they, the, the guards armoured perhaps leading the way because cap badges allow them. Cap badges actually help the guards armoured because they've got two battalions of Welsh, two battalions of Scots, and two battalions of Grenadiers, I think, and what else. Sounds so, about right. And, 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 and they're able to, and two battalions of Irish, it's the, the cold streams aren't there. And of those two battalions, one is on tanks and one is infantry. And they take their recce regiment, watch and they mix them all up, and they just create um, four battle groups, each of tanks and infantry, and they're aided by the regimental system. The yeah, Guard Armoured, I would argue, is, is the best, is the premier armoured division in, Norm in, in North West, well, in Normandy, I would say. I, I think they're helped organisationally by um, cap badge benefits, yeah. whereas, whereas all the other regiments suffer throughout the 30s by the, the regimental system. And um, the independent brigades don't get enough 
written about them. I mean, John Barclay's seminal book about British armour in Normandy is mostly about the armour divisions because there's only so much you can put in his book and it was his PhD thesis, but there's, it, it doesn't really go into independent brigades. And Americans tend to, in the opposite way, well, the same kind of way, they write about the armour divisions but don't do so much about the independent Tampertans. They're doing a similar thing, and that's battalions, not brigades so that so we, we tend to we're still only we're still learning from the point of view of the divisions and there's a lot more work to be done and then you get into recce regiments which gets to another whole and, and we haven't mentioned area haven't tank destroyers and then you get the and the then tank very, destroyers the very subtle one the the indian army cavalry regiments who reorganized to become reconnaissance regiments for infantry brigades um and and they're a wonderful story throughout italy the the the, the three um Duke of Connaught six, the, the the Central India horse, and the third one I can't remember which it is. Um, but that's that's a totally different uh, subject. So just um, thank you for that. And just if anyone's re uh, watching this, are there any good books about that 1930s period that would, would be a kind of a must read in order to kind of get a sense of that? Because I know people they they yes. they know their wartime books, but is there even much written about that period that kind of breaks it down? I mean, I know um, there are books about tanks, but I'm talking well, about think, the doctoring and well, the, uh, the training approach. Doesn't John Buckley's PhD cover this? I'm pretty sure it does. And so, so I'm always anything to do with armor, and because he looks at doctrine and equipment, John Buckley. John Buckley. Um, sorry, ben Kite's him. book, I know. Ben, ben um, Kite's done a lot of writing about that as well. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure John's PhD, if not his master's degree, is in in that area. There's a couple out there. Um, there there's there's um, men, ideas, tanks. Um, by Harris, but but again, these aren't not cheap. They're not in print anymore. Um, and um, to change an army, which is um, by Winton, about um, um, covers it. Um, Little Heart, lots of his stuff. The the the, the, the history of the tank corps, the tanks uh, covers it. But there's not much modern writing. There's and the fact that we're talking about books that are out of print and written by people who died 50 years ago and more is is telling of the fact that this is an underappreciated, under-examined aspect. We talk so much about what was happening during the war, but we are, I, I'm realizing that when you pitched this show to me, I thought it was, I was like, yeah, it was a really good idea. Talk about the lessons that we did and didn't learn during the 1930s. And um, yeah, it's just a fascinating little, little insight into an era that without it realizing it, she, it shapes things imp incredibly, um, yeah. both positively and negatively. But Anyway, we've done an hour and a quarter, which is more than I thought. So I've thoroughly enjoyed it, Gareth. So um, we can come much, back Rudy. and do some stuff about independent tank brigades or whatever. Um, in terms of everybody watching, this is our first of five shows. So Rich Fisher's on tomorrow talking about tank machine guns and what and what exactly they're supposed to do. I mean, we've all seen them, the little pointy ones sticking out the front of the armors of Sherman tanks and Cromwells and what have you. But what, they, what were they supposed to do? What was the actual role? How did they get developed what was their purpose what were the pitfalls what were the shortcomings well we'll find out with rich a similar i think kind of two old mates chatting kind of conversation because i've known rich about 25 years plus so we'll be talking about that tomorrow then we've got neil's coming on talking about german armor and normally bust a few myths right. about exactly what the germans had at their disposal then then prit butard the incredible prit butard is going to come on and talk about soviet armor developments and which i think will dovetail very nicely with what garrett's done tonight about the soviet approach to armor and the 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 problems they saw facing them and how they overcame those problems then philip is coming on to talk about the 79th armor division hobart again but this time in the battle of the Scheldt estuary and particularly that again the 79th armor division are perhaps given a bit too much credit and it's the royal engineers and royal canadian engineers who need a bit of bigging up there the incredible cooperation between armor and engineers and of course infantry in that oft forgotten battle for the shell destry which was incredibly important and overlooked so there we are so um again thanks gareth for joining us um My pleasure. And thanks, I think if you don't follow gareth on twitter it's always good to get a lot of tank tank stuff first world war stuff and, and a bit of angst and a bit of angst about where the army is going in the future and ministry of defense kind of talk so but you also i want to I will compliment you, Gareth, for your always bigging up the younger up and coming historians, the female historians, the young people as well. You're not, you are like me, part of the kind of the red trouser brigade, middle aged white guy thing, but yes. you're very much yes. and, one um, of those pushing forward the, 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 the younger people who are coming in with some wonderfully creative new ideas and new ways of looking at things. And that's always important. Yes. That people absolutely. like yourself champion some of these younger people yes. because. 
we won't be around forever and what we say isn't always correct we need the young I'm, people coming in yeah i'm i'm i'm, I'm on the wane get 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 some new people in absolutely yeah well because we're just repeating ourselves and getting old <laughs> and thinking about our cocoa so there we are thanks very much for watching folks i thanks. will see you all again tomorrow for part two of tank week as usual don't forget to consider becoming a patron via patreon.com any links below consider going to our bookshops and picking up some of the titles we talk about. But other than that, I will see you all tomorrow and we'll continue Tank Week. Thanks for watching. This is Paul Woodard and Gareth saying thank you. Have a good evening.